today and the horsepower shop were just a few performance parts away from turning our 460 big block into a big horse performer on the dyno. This is a Ford project motor of ours that's already had two different personalities in less than two months. The first one was a basic power plant we put together on a ridiculously low budget right at $2,000. After a little hard work and a few easy on the pocket parts, we made a respectable 378 horsepower and 493 foot pounds of torque. Well, last week we tossed out the rule book and set out to see how much power we could put to that mostly stock bottom end after we beefed it up with a stud girdle. We installed a hydraulic roller cam in place of the flat tabbit budget cam, bolted on a set of TrickFlow power port heads, and upgraded the oiling system with a John Cossey bulletproof pump and a Barroso high capacity pan. The next pieces in our valve train are these Comp Cams hydraulic roller lifters that we went ahead and soaked in oil. Now let's talk about push rods. Anytime you build a custom engine like this, it's almost impossible to predict the correct length of the push rod. And that's because there's so many different variables like block deck height, even camshaft base circle, and the list goes on and on. Now before we show you how to get the right length for your motor, here's a look at why it's so critical. Stamp steel rockers have a large flat where they make contact with the valve stem, keeping the load on the entire tip of the valve. So correct length is not as critical because the flat on the rocker compensates for the air. On a roller tip rocker, the area that meets the valve stem is very narrow. If you miss the correct length by just a little, you'll get tremendous valve guide and seal wear. To find the correct pushrod length, you're gonna need an adjustable pushrod checker and some die chem machinist die. Now this job is so easy, a monkey in a sack can do it. First, mark the valve stem with the die chem. Now drop the checking tool into place. Install the rocker arm, followed by the adjustment nut. Next, extend the push rod so that the tip of the rocker is centered over the valve stem. Finally, rotate the crankshaft three rotations. This will wear a pattern into the die on the valve stem. After that first round, it looks like our push rod was a little too short. The wear line into the die cam is above the center of the valve stem, so we'll lengthen the push rod checking tool and bring it down to center. Repeat the same steps as before until the wear mark is centered on the valve stem. Of course, after measuring the checking tool, you'll have the correct length to order a set and get them on its way. Now I went ahead and called Comp Cams in order to set a high-tech 3 8 push rods that measure in at 8200. With the rocker arms in place, I'm going to adjust the valves a half a turn past zero lash. Last time when we kicked off this project, we gave you a peek at this single plane high rise intake manifold that we're stepping up to. It's a perfect match for the power port heads and it's got a flange design that accepts the 4150 Holly that we'll drop on a little bit later. Man, these valve covers definitely put the trick and trick flow with a ready to race design that easily clears roller rockers and stud girdles. Plus they come with hardware that uses O-rings and they pass from the top through these welded in tubes down to the gasket rail. This will help ensure rail stiffness and of course promote better gasket sealing. Are you ready? Are you ready? If you want old style looks with new technology, Holly has taken the 4150 to the new level with the 4150 HP. Now this thing has cast main bodies without any choke horns and down leg style boosters. On the bottom side, it's got stainless steel throttle plates and it even comes with screw in air bleeds. Now one of the cool user friendly features are the Dominator style fuel balls you can plumb from either side. Now we got ours in a thousand CFM. Well, these are some of the parts that came off the 460 for this next level of the project. And of course, we'll repurpose all of these, including this stock points type distributor that we upgraded. Now that was great for the budget phase, but uh, not for our power plants today. We're gonna need something like this MSD Pro billet. Now this thing has seal ball bearings that guide the shaft to up to 10,000 RPMs and more. Now inside, the rotor is molded from race-ready DuPont Rhinite material. It has a magnetic pickup to trigger the ignition and a chrome molly mechanical advance assembly. Now, after get the cap on, I got one more little tweak and we'll be ready to put it in. 
Anytime you use a roller cam, you should always remove the cast gear that comes on the shaft and replace it with a softer bronze gear. It's much easier and cheaper to replace the gear than hurt the motor. All right, man, we all primed up? Already prime time, baby. Okay, we got a hoe down for this thing. I'm not talking about a barn dance down yeah. south, you know. You gotta get it in first, though. I know, it. there we go. All right, we come back, we'll get the headers on and see if this motor runs as wickedly as it looks. Stay with us. You got that thing? Mm-hmm. Cool. Hey, we're just a few steps away from firing up our Ford 460 Big Block, which has gone from strictly budget to strictly bad to the Blue Oval. Now, header clearance is often an issue when you put your motor on a dyno cart and get it ready for a test. So we had the guys at Cook's Custom Headers fab up this killer set for us. They're stainless steel with two inch primaries that poke out like a metal octopus. Well, finally a new set of plug wires, eight and a half mil MSD superconductors in our case, and we're popping them on some E3 spark plugs that might add a few ponies to our horsepower tally. The motor's warmed up and hey, we're pumped up, but we're gonna walk before we run too hard. First with a 5,000 RPM pole for 533 horsepower. Yeah, we're definitely not close to peak. So after a few more runs and some more timing, we're ready to see what happens at six grand. Five ninety six. <laughs> well, right, let's see. That's pretty close. Yeah. But this ain't horseshoes. Surely we can make six hundred. Now we're going to see what happens with lighter springs that came with our distributor and another degree and a half of time. Oh, ah! there it is. All right. Good job. <laughs> Not just 600, but 607. What we ought to do is get a, get a four-door LTD, like the mid-80s model, the old granny one, yeah, just all yeah. around and put this thing in it. <laughs> just do a sleeper. Oh, uh, your ultimate sleeper. Oh, man, I'm so stoked we hit that 600 mark. But, you know, even though this is a cool old motor that makes great power, the 460 is old school when you compare it with, well, something like this. Since introduced in 1997, the LS1 has been rightfully called a modern-day marvel. Lightweight aluminum heads. Plenty of fuel-injected power right from the factory. So why would anybody in their right mind want to feed a high-tech motor like this with something as low-tech as this? Well, maybe it offers them a chance to drop an affordable, modern-day, powerful motor in through their vintage hot rod and not have to worry about fuel lines, uh, gas tank swaps, computers, harnesses. Need I say more? Let's face it, young car guys may call them toilets or even controlled fuel leaks. Disrespectful pumps. Yeah, it's better than being an old box of dust, yeah. though. But when it comes to tuning, there's still a comfort level in carbs. That's why we contacted Pace Performance to try out one of their carb conversion kits for the LS1. Now, it comes with a front cover, a distributor drive gear kit, a four-barrel GM Performance intake manifold, set of valve covers, and all the hardware you need to get that side of the job done. Now, what it doesn't come with and you will need is a new dampener, distributor, wires, and last but not least, a carburetor. Now to get the thing started, Joe and I are gonna tear down our stock LS1. Okay, first the coil facts have to go, along with the valve covers. Then we can pull the balancer and remove the front cover. After loosening the oil pan, we can disconnect the oil pickup. Now the timing set can come off. The bottom gear is a little more stubborn, but it's gotta go too. All right, great use of a hose clamp. Just that. To pull that off. Now we'll spin the cam around, get those lifters stuck up in the boards on the LS1s. So the lifters oh, actually right. get captured in the boards as you spin the cam over. So it makes cam removal very easy. Since we've got valve train changes in store, we're also removing the heads for now. Finally, the lifters can come out. We're using a new dampener so we have timing marks to go by, but it's not just as simple as sliding it into place. See, up here on the crank snout, we have one keyway, but that's for the oil pump eccentric and the timing chain gear. Now, to keep the balancer from spinning on the crank snout and positioning it correctly, we got this drill pin fixture kit from ATI. Now, this thing is going to slide onto the crank snout and then bolts into place. 
and we'll be able to drill in our pin and align it correctly. With the fixture secured, insert the 11 64 bushing and snug it with the holding screw. Then using the supplied bit, drill through the crank to the center bore. Now swap the bushing to the 3 16 one and secure it in place as well. Using the reamer from the kit, make one slow speed pass through the hole. Finally, remove the fixture and insert the dowel pin, allowing it to protrude above the crank surface. We're going to use the template from the instruction sheet to drill two small holes into the cam retainer plate. Now the two holes are there so we get adequate oiling to the camshaft and distributor gear. Since we're going old school with the carb, we're installing a comp thumper cam to deliver that vintage hot rod sound. Plus, we should get more serious performance to back it up with higher max lift and duration numbers than stock. Next, a new double roller timing set goes into place, along with the adapter from our distributor cam drive kit, followed by the fuel pump distributor drive gear. Now we can install this oil pump drive eccentric and reinstall the oil pump using spacers from the kit to clear the new double roller chain. Well, now we can cover all that business up with this special front cover from the kit. Now, this thing comes with an adjustable timing pointer, and it's got holes machined in for the distributor and a mechanical fuel pump. But if the uh, hot rodder in you has to have more, you can always block that thing off and use a remote electric pump. It goes on using the factory bolts from the original cover. Now the oil pan can go back in place. And we can install the new balancer to finish our work up front. Whenever we put a new cam in a motor, we always like to use a new set of lifters. And that's because we don't want any irregular wear patterns. Now we're using a set of high energy comp rollers and the easiest way to put them in an LS1 is first into the retainer and then just slide them into the hole. All right, with new gaskets laid down, we can reinstall the stock heads and guide plates for our Comp Pro Magna roller rockers with a ratio of 1.75. Now we can bolt up the aluminum valve covers from our PACE kit. And finally, the GM Performance Parts single plane intake manifold, also from the kit. And now, we're just a couple of steps away from our first ever run on a carbureted LS1. Hey, we're back, and as we told you earlier, you got to come up with your own distributor for this conversion, which needs to be, believe it or not, one for a small block 302 Ford, like this one we got from MSD. Now, this time, we swapped out this cast gear for one of Comp's composite gears that, unlike bronze, are designed to virtually never wear out. We also had to come up with our own carb, so we went with a polished Holley 750 double pumper that will feed with premium fuel. Now since our dyno already has a fuel system built in, we went ahead and blocked off the provision for the mechanical fuel pump on the front cover. Now if you're going to install this setup in a later model LS equipped vehicle, you need to remember that you'll have to come up with a fuel system for your ride because the in-tank pump puts out too much pressure for a carburetor. To clear our timing cover, we're using two and a half inch spacers from Wagner along with our old trusty electric Mazir pump. Now, as a point of reference, these later model LS1 motors were rated at the factory 350 horsepower, 365 foot-pounds of torque. Now, that's the number we got to beat, but we're going to take it easy on this first run, 4,000 RPMs, then we'll step it up. We're already close to the baseline on horsepower and already over the factory torque number, 334 and 438. All right, let's try one at 5,500. <laughs> 453 foot-pounds of torque and the horsepower is still climbing at 470. All right, one more run, this time 6,000 RPM. Four hundred and ninety horsepower, four hundred and fifty-seven foot-pounds of torque. Now, in all fairness, this motor would have been run at the factory with all the front accessory drive and the emissions equipment, which would have held it back a little bit. Yeah, but not a hundred forty horsepower. Yeah. Once again, this project's probably best suited to somebody who needs to drop a motor into, let's say, a street ride. What's some of the advantages of the LS motor without the accessories you need for EFI? However. 
old school, new school, a class of their own. Don't yeah, you like? like our class right here. Yeah. Check out that power curve. Look at it. Oh, that's sweet. It climbs nice. Power tools are the ticket for working fast and efficiently in your shop, but dragging this hose around, well, it can be a real drag sometimes, and you can't take that thing everywhere. Well, check out these IR IQV cordless creations we got from PowerToolbox.net. Impact and ratchet in quarter inch, three eighths, and half inch sizes, plus drill drive, cut off wheel, and much more. Now, these tools are lightweight, quiet and tough thanks to a housing that's reinforced with a heavy metal subframe. Check out this feature. Push this button here and you can check the status of your lithium battery. Now I like the way they come off too. Now when it's time to charge, stick it in this universal charger for a charge up to 19.2 volts. Now they come separately or in sets of tools that are designed to fit your needs. Individual tools start at only 70 bucks. And again, they're from PowerToolbox.net.